Um, all right, thank you. Uh, and so uh, I would like to introduce everyone today to William Wang uh, from UCSB. Uh, so William Wang is the Duncan and Susan uh, Millichamp Chair in AI and Design and an Assistant Professor in the Department of CS at UCSB. He is furthermore a Director at UCSB's NLP Group and Center for Responsible Machine Learning. Uh, he has broad interest in machine learning, as you can see, in both NLP uh, and, 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 NLP, uh, and machine learning, including statistical and relational learning, uh, information extraction, and computational social science and vision. Uh, he received a PhD in uh, Carnegie Mellon University and has over 100 papers in NLP AI vision conferences. Um, and also has received uh, several awards, uh, most notably, uh, most recently, the NSF Career Award. I want to congratulate you on that, um, as well as, of course, um, uh, paper awards and nominations, a DARPA Young Faculty Award for 2018, and the IEEE Intelligence Systems uh, AI's 10 to Watch uh, for 2020. Um, so with that, uh, please, uh, I would love for you to, to uh, Share, us, share with us uh, your, your talk, William. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for a very nice introduction. And it is my great honor to uh, visit uh, USC again. I was just you know, checking my timeline. I think I, my first visit to USC was about 11 years ago when I gave a talk at the NLP seminar. But uh, this is uh, great to be back uh, virtually. But of course, you know, I hope to visit uh, the two wonderful buildings at uh, Marina del Rey at some point uh, when it's safe to do so. So great. So today um, I will talk about our recent work on learning to reason with text and tables. Uh, this is a joint work with my students, uh, Wen Hu Chen and Wen Han Xiong. So Wen Hu just accepted the faculty position at the University of Waterloo and then uh, Wen Han just graduated and uh, went off to Facebook AI. So this is mostly their work. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at uh, Wen Han's PhD defense, right? And he was demonstrating a state-of-the-art multi-hop open domain question answering system that he built at Facebook uh, last year. And I think he open sourced the code. Um, you should be able to find a code and repository for MDR from the Facebook AI uh, repository. And I was, you know, very eager to uh, try out some of the queries that I had, right? So I asked, who is the president of the United States when Churchill was the prime minister of UK, right? So for those of you who are interested in history, so this is during the World War II. And, you know, of course, you know, sometimes you want to ask this interesting correlation questions and want to understand, um, you know, specific piece of knowledge. So it turned out that his system was actually able to generate answer for this a relatively challenging uh, multi-hop question. So if you actually search on Google, uh, it does not give you a direct answer because you know it is slightly complicated because you have to find, you know, uh, okay, so when was Churchill the prime minister of UK during which period? And then you search. So who was the president of the United States at that time? So um, this is not particularly a high frequent um, question, but I would say, in many of these interesting domains like digital humanity, in biomedical expert search, in financial domain, uh, these questions are still very commonly asked. So I was very you know, surprised with the quality uh, of this MDR system that he actually built. So if you're interested, feel free to uh, give it a try. And of course, you know, when I was trying the system, I was always interested in you know, seeing how I can break the system, right? So then I asked, what is the second biggest city in California, right? So it seems like a very, you know, relatively uh, simple question, uh, but unfortunately uh, his system failed, uh, didn't give an answer, but Google search uh, actually quickly give you the correct answer. So it said uh, the second biggest city in California is actually San Diego. So if you look closer at uh, how Google actually came up with the correct answer, you will see that it didn't actually pull the answer from just the text document. It actually found a table uh, demonstrating the um, population uh, for California cities. Um, and this is clearly pulling the information from the second row of this table. So um, in my opinion, I think being able to understand uh, heterogeneous uh, information, heterogeneous sources 
is just as important as understanding complex queries. Um, and I think it's certainly it is the case when we think about uh, the world knowledge, right? So uh, if you want to ask a question about specific person, specific events, um, often the information you got, let's say only on the knowledge graph or the structure information is limited because we all know the coverage, right? For, um, you know, knowledge graph has always been an issue. So that's why often, you know, in the past we resort to free text, right? So then sometimes there are additional information from free text, even though extracting uh, the free text information could be noisy, could be difficult. Uh, but I think still in the past, we've, sh we've shown that, you know, combining text and the knowledge graph really help. But I think my point here is that in addition to text and knowledge graph, there are also other source of important sources of information. For example, figures, tables, even images, I think provide a lot of um, important information uh, to improve uh, the quality of open domain question answering system. So uh, my thesis here is to really, um, you know, trying to convince you that we do need to understand uh, knowledge in various of different forms, whether they are structured, semi-structured, or unstructured, I think um, we should be able to have AI systems uh, to extract uh, information from different representations and being able to present them to the user. So ideally, if you want to build, I think, a knowledge grounded NLP system, having an understanding components to extract the correct answer, um, that corresponds to very is important. But in many cases, for example, dialogue systems, right, that we also need to have uh, generation components that allows us to synthesize um, and generate high quality answers, right, to the user. So NLG is something that I also hope to talk about in the third part of the talk. And the first part of the talk, I will demonstrate a um, earlier system that we built uh, in uh, last year and in 2019 that we started to uh, think about what would be some tasks that allows us to uh, check the reasoning capability of um, you know, texts and tables and other heterogeneous sources. So one thing we thought about would be interesting is that if we actually make a statement, um, can we actually check again underlying tables and knowledge graph and documents um, and trying to understand you know, how likely uh, that statement is true or false, right? So this is sort of like fact checking with the underlying you know, uh, world knowledge, which I think is uh, still a very important problem for journalism and also for um, other areas as well. The second part of the talk, I will talk about a more um, you know, generalized version of fact checking. So that is basically question answering, right? With uh, heterogeneous representation. So uh, what if someone asks a question, right? So would you be able to answer any of the question in addition to just you know give a, a verdict on whether this is true or false um, according to your underlying um, heterogeneous uh, representation. So uh, question answering, I think, would be uh, very important to achieve this because it's more general. It also allows us uh, to answer a uh, different type of questions we have. And finally, like I promised that towards the end, hopefully I'll have some time to talk about data to text generation. And for data to text generation, this would be the situation where you, let's say, you retrieve some information from the database and you want to synthesize that information uh, to the user. You want to, for example, go from the uh, Wikipedia info box information uh, to um, you know, the first sentence in Wikipedia. So this is you know, data to text generation that I'll focus on, but I uh, imagine the situation also applies, right, for dialogue systems. So if you have, um, you know, structured information that you retrieve from databases, how would you be able to synthesize and generate high quality uh, responses uh, to the user with regard to the underlying background knowledge, okay? So these are the three parts of the talk. Uh, the first part, I will do it uh, right now, uh, which is about understanding text and the tables at the same time. So I think um, there are a lot of different papers along this line of work in um, understanding a language and specifically trying to reason about the relationship among different sentences. So for example, 
uh, some of you may know that I know they go from um, uh, Bar Ilan University, actually, they have this um, very interesting work on uh, recognizing textual entailment um, back into, you know, 2006, right? So when they were first looking at, you know, if I have two sentences, can I uh, determine what is the relationship, right, among uh, this uh, pair of sentences? So uh, they want to recognize, for example, whether the meaning of the first sentence is contained in the second sentence. And in recent years, um, many of you know, there's the Stanford uh, Natural Language Inference Database uh, that was created by uh, Bowman et al. in 2015. And it also um, allows users to be able to understand uh, the relationship among this uh, you know, a pair of sentences, but um, it can be entailment, it can be a contradiction, uh, it can be neutral. So there are all sorts of um, information um, that uh, users uh, can actually uh, try. So uh, in this case, um, the general goal of, um, you know, uh, language reasoning is to basically looking at the, you know, pair and then uh, you want to build a system to actually trying to tell whether this is uh, entailed or uh, this is uh, refuted or not, okay? So, uh, and now I, I would say that, um, you know, this particular example sort of summarizes, it, right? So you would often have a premise and the premise in this case is that woman is uh, selling bamboo sticks, talking to two men on a loading dock, right? So this is sort of like, you know, the assumption, and then you would have hypothesis uh, for different labels, right? For example, one label is entailment, and entailment is basically saying that there are at least three people on the loading dock, right? So in this case, there is a woman and two men, so that we can easily entail that there are at least three people, but how well can machine do that, right? So that's actually what we need to figure out. And the other thing is contradiction, so it's a different type of label, in this case, uh, is basically uh, saying that a woman is not taking money from any of her sticks. And uh, based on you know uh, knowledge that we can tell uh, that this is certainly not true because when we talk about selling, um, it often involves money transactions, right? So uh, this is what the uh, data set looks like. Uh, but the challenge, as you can see with this line of research, when you get neural network involved, is that neural networks are specifically very good at exploiting artifactual artifacts from annotation process, right? What do I mean by that? For example, um, many people actually found out that the SNLI data set is broken because using only the hypothesis, right, without the premise can actually get you fairly decent accuracy. So that doesn't make any sense, right? Because you don't even know what is the premise and you're only looking at a sen second sentence and you're trying to tell the relationship between two sentences. So what's going on is that there is this uh, spurious uh, correlations between uh, the second sentence, right? To the first sentence. Uh, and actually correlating, right? With some particular domain. So that's why that you don't even have to look at the first sentence by just looking at a second sentence right? and you can actually get a fairly high accuracy in classifying one of the label uh, into uh, one, of, um, uh, one, one of the, um, uh, the, the, pre, uh, the hypothesis into one of the uh, labels. So for example, right? So when uh, they were creating this data set, uh, they just sample some examples for this an entailment class, right? This entailment class happened to be actually all from, or a lot of them actually from the uh, animal domain, right? So that's why even though you just use the second sentence and you want to do classification, you can actually classify it really well because whenever uh, your neural network sees any mentions or any, um, you know, semantic uh, hidden vectors about animal, then it's automatically classifying this into entailment and you can do it really well without even looking at the first sentence. So this is uh, clearly uh, broken and uh, this is relatively difficult to avoid uh, because uh, we're not gonna get all of the, you know, pair of the sentences we have in the world. So you cannot estimate the true risk, right? In empirical risk and, and minimization. So you can only get a subset of the data. And when you actually, as human to sample the subset of the data, 
it's very easy, right, to actually get this unwanted bias from this data set. And you end up with a broken data set uh, without knowing it. So, um, so that's sort of like what's going on with the, you know, uh, textual entailment, right? And also the natural language inference world. But we believe that in addition uh, to the free form language, I think it's also important to be able to model graph, table, and websites in some of this semi-structured resources. So for example, um, you know, how would you be able to um, understand, right? Build a system to understand tables, right? And text at the same time. So, um, so what Wenhu did a few years ago is that um, we actually uh, worked together and explored this fact verification problem under Wikipedia um, semi-structured tables, right? So we take uh, the existing, um, you know, uh, Wikipedia table data set and they build on this. So we ended up with 16,000 open domain Wikipedia tables, not about specific domain, but a variety of domains uh, in Wikipedia. And then we have mechanical turkers to annotate this more than uh, 100,000 uh, statements. And we divide them into two classes, entailment and uh, 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 ref uh, refutation, these two categories. So here is an example of this uh, tab fact data set. So for example, here's a particular table about uh, US House of Representative elections in 1972. And someone actually made a statement saying that Moss and Burton are both reelected, right, in the House of Representatives uh, election in 1972. So in this case, how do we know whether this is true or false, right? So we actually have annotators to go into this table and verify uh, this is true or false with this particular statement. So that human is very easy to do. You just need to find these two uh, people. They are the first row and uh, the second row, right? And then you can look at their election result and turn out that both of them are re-elected. So very easy for human to do this. And we can get a relatively uh, good performance, right? With this particular task. And um, in addition to just being able to locate the cells and also trying to understand multiple cells and multiple columns, we also have some um, you know, higher level operations that will human can do it really well, but we're very curious how machine can do, right? When they were trying to reason with text and tables. So in this case, uh, we ask, um, you know, in this election, four out of five incumbents are reelected. So is this true or not, right? So uh, when human at the table, we know where we should be looking at. We actually need to look at all of these uh, five incumbents, and then uh, started to look at their uh, re-election result, right? So it turned out there's one person actually lost the re-nomination. So actually there were only four, right? Out of the five incumbents are re-elected in that re-election. So relatively easy for human to do, but can machines do the counting, right? Does the machine know that it needs to do the counting, right? So I think this is uh, kind of interesting. And can you do the counting correctly, right? Um, would you be able to pinpoint, right, to specific uh, cells and specific columns and do the counting? So I think it definitely poses some challenge uh, for machine reasoning um, at the um, uh, table level together with the text statements that we have. Um, we also have some negative examples in addition to positive examples in this database. So for example, um, that we would say that Moss and Miller are both reelected in the House of Representative election. And if you look at this table, uh, this is actually uh, not true because again, the second person Miller was, um, you know, um, actually, he actually lost uh, the uh, renomination process. Okay, so uh, this is a negative example we have. And again, we also have this higher level operations, something relating to counting and also um, to understand um, you know, their party affiliations and would you be able to account for different subgroups and then uh, compare them, right? So I think it's all very easy things for human to do. But again, for machine, uh, based on our understanding, uh, this is uh, still challenging because if you want to automate the whole process, um, looks easy, but actually it's not so easy to do, okay? Um, and like I said, uh, the challenges is basically mixed reasoning that in addition to the structured information in the table, there are actually also unstructured information. There are tags, there are free tags 
in these tables, right? So that definitely posed a lot of challenges because tables are not like knowledge graph or databases, because in this case, uh, there are actually free text, right? There are strings uh, in certain cells, right? So how can your system actually understand uh, some of the free text uh, in this table? So it, it requires structured reasoning, but also uh, linguistic reasoning. So both symbolic reasoning and linguistic reasoning are required uh, to be able to do well uh, in this task. So a few years ago, we actually tried a few models, right, for this uh, particular problem. So one thing we've, uh, one direction we've taken is more on the classic semantic parsing uh, literature, right? So uh, what if we actually parse this uh, sentence into a logical program or into a symbolic representation? Can we execute, right, this logic form against this table and then verify, you know, whether this particular statement is true or not, right? So this is uh, much aligned to the earlier work on semantic parsing. And the second baseline is uh, pretty much aligned to the recent literature on BERT. Um, and it um, also aligns well to the recent literature on natural language inference. So what if we actually just use a simple method to linearize this table into a paragraph of sentences and then use this large scale pre-trained language models to verify uh, the factual correctness? Uh, how well can we do, right? So we'll be very curious with this two very different style of uh, solutions. So to briefly talk about the latent program analysis approach. Um, so this requires some sort of uh, feature-based uh, entity linking, right? Because you do need to link uh, the, uh, you know, the noun phrases in your sentence into the cells, right? In your table, because we have to understand what do we mean by Democrats, right? What do we mean by Republicans? So there are some entity linking and search uh, in the table uh, that is happening. So after MTD linking, then we will be able to know, okay, so which roles are actually related to Republicans and which uh, roles are related to Democrats. Um, and then, you know, when someone makes the statements, there are more Democrats than Republicans in this election, then we can basically count, right? Like, you know, how many Democrats we've observed in this table and how many Republicans we have and finally, after you finish the counting of these different subgroups, then um, you know our system can compare uh, the you know the counts right for different groups, um, and then being able to verify whether this uh, statement is true or not. If it's true, then in this case, uh, it's entailed. Um, the second approach is also kind of very interesting. It's much easier and simpler than the first approach, and the uh, idea is to basically trying to um, transfer the style of these tables, right, into uh, text. So uh, in this case, we can do a horizontal scan or a vertical scan of this table and basically say that, well, you know, row one, the game is 51 and date is February the 3rd. So then we can actually uh, also have positions uh, allocated to each of this uh, individual token level. And then uh, we can use the template, right? Uh, with this natural language, uh, when we're doing this uh, conversion, going from table to text. And then once we actually converted the table into text uh, together, right? With your query together with the assessment, then we can just send them both, right? Into BERT. And because this is a supervised learning data set, we can do some fine tuning with the BERT model, and then we can verify, right, the uh, performance of this BERT model uh, in this uh, table BERT solution. So here's the interesting part. Um, if we only use the text, right, we are actually showing here that you only get 50% um, accuracy. So this is sort of like the, you know, the chance, because by using only the statement without the table, we will not be able to find uh, the correct answer. So this data set is relatively uh, balanced and clean so that you won't be able to just use this sentence to infer uh, the uh, correctness, right? So you have to find uh, the table and be able to verify that against the table. And we tried the table bar approach. Um, it gave about, you know, 65% accuracy. So it's much better than, um, you know, the, the chance. 
Uh, the interesting thing is that if you use this LPA approach, semantic parsing, um, it gives you about a 65% um, accuracy as well. So uh, the other interesting observation is that, as you can see, human can do it relatively well with this task, right? So uh, with Mechanical Turk, um, you don't even have to train people, right? So it's basically layman annotation, and you are able to get 92% accuracy uh, in performing this task. Whereas for uh, table bird and also um, LPA ranking with transformer, still we're only able to get about 65% uh, percent accuracy. So in recent years, um, I think last year, uh, Google's um, Google AI team, they actually created a uh, pre-trained model on tables. Um, and this is the Tapas model and some other models from uh, the Google AI group in Zurich. And they were able to improve uh, the performance to about uh, 70%. So um, right now, I think some of the better teams on um, TabFact, they were able to get about 70%, uh, more than 70% accuracy on this task. So uh, we're still uh, closing the gap, but I think uh, this is sort of like a very interesting benchmark of you know, uh, teaching machines to reason and understand tables and text at the same time. So if we take a closer look at the strengths right, and weaknesses of both approaches, uh, we can really see some interesting observations right, from um, these two uh, you know, uh, schools of thought uh, from the last decade. For example, the semantic parsing approach, it is explainable, um, it works well, uh, but again, as you can see, it highly uh, dependent on the performance of entity linking. So if your entity linking failed, uh, it's relatively unlikely, right, that you'll be able to get a correct answer. And also, this uh, scalability is kind of an issue because let's say if you want to scale this to a different domain, let's say COVID-19 or financial domain, then um, I would imagine that you will have to rewrite, right, your some of your predicates, you have to you know, rewrite some of the rules uh, to be able to adapt this right, to a new domain. Uh, so this certainly uh, requires some human engineering and efforts. So uh, this is sort of like the pros and cons for LPA. For table board, um, the interesting thing with table board is that it's a very general solution. So you can basically uh, linearize any tables you want, whether you want to do it horizontally or whether you want to do it vertically. You can say what is the header, you can say what is the column, um, but again, uh, this is kind of a bit unnatural in the sense that, you know, again, uh, they are just the tables, right? So we're just forcing the tables and we're converting them into the text. Uh, is this the best approach to do? Probably not. But uh, the other issue is that the training could be difficult, right? Because the BERT model, again, was language model it was uh, not actually trained on uh, table data, right? So that's why when you see we trained this table part model, uh, there were a lot of difficulties during the process because the you know, objectives keeps you know, fluctuating during the uh, training process. Uh, so training can be relatively unstable and there's also no uh, explainability. You only get you know, the final performance and the final verdict. So, Certainly, there are pros and cons uh, with each of these two uh, approaches. And um, I would say, um, but again, this particular data set right, itself, it offers a relatively uh, interesting area that allows us to uh, reason with structured information and unstructured information. And I would say that both of these two uh, directions are promising. They have pros and cons. It'd be interesting about neurosymbolic reasoning that combines the pros and cons of both approaches. Um, so that would be some very interesting ways to actually try uh, with this TAFAC data set. And how would you be able to design right, a powerful model to combine linguistic and symbolic reasoning? I think this remains as an open research question. Um, and uh, Finally, I think, um, you know, as opposed to some of the recent uh, work, as we can see, BERT pretty much crashes on everything. Um, I think on this data set, it's still challenging because machine reasoning uh, with this heterogeneous representation, 
um, is relatively difficult, right, for neural networks to do because it's not like you can just simply capture the correlation between input and output. You do really need to have a mechanism to understand the structure and being able to derive the reasoning to come up with the sophisticated answer. So uh, it is still uh, way behind uh, humans' reasoning capability. So this is the first part. Um, I would pause here for just a second in case there's any questions. Does anyone have a question? Uh, it appears not, so feel free to continue. Sounds good. So um, if you want to try this data set, the data set is available uh, on GitHub, um, yeah, tapback.github.io. Second part, I think is also quite interesting because now we want to generalize fact checking into question answering, right? So how would you be able to do question answering with both table and text? Um, Again, I think text only and table only, this is um, again, familiar to the NLP community. For example, the text space, uh, QA, uh, some of the more popular literature, I think started after the squad data set. So this is mostly reading comprehension. So assume that we already have the ground truth document, right? We know where the answer is located. The answer is somewhere in this document. Then you can build neural network systems trying to extract the start an end token, right, of this, uh, uh, each of this question. So uh, there are a lot of different papers following this line of work on reading comprehension based research. And before that, uh, there are also some work on table based and knowledge based question answering. And this is mostly the line of work on semantic parsing. So they want to build semantic parsers to parse the statement into a semantic representation. So then they can check against, right, this table and be able to uh, execute again this table and find the answer. So uh, certainly I think there are um, you know, uh, interesting earlier work along this line. But again, the question we're asking is how will us be able to leverage right, both uh, the text and table information and really understand questions right, that requires both text and table to understand uh, and correctly and this, uh, answer the question, okay? So uh, for the, uh, the reading comprehension, uh, you won't be surprised, right? Because it's pretty much dominated by BERT um, after 2018. So a lot of different architectural modifications over BERT uh, in the past few years that actually prove uh, the performance of reading comprehension on SQUAD to be over 90, 92%. So uh, pretty much nobody's working on SQUAD right now, but uh, this is a very recent history of the reading comprehension work. In our case, uh, we asked the question that, you know, can we really utilize text QA and table QA to answer some of these more difficult questions, right? For example, the multi hop questions. So if someone was asking, uh, when was the runner up song for Billboard Hot 2019 release? And if you only look at this table, right, the table itself doesn't give you the answer. Um, um, and the text snippet itself also doesn't give you the answer, right? So you first have to look at the table, uh, Billboard's 2019 uh, year-end half 100 chart, and then locate. Okay, so here I'm looking at the runner-up, which is the second song, and the second song's name is Sunflower. Then uh, how would you be able to build a system to reason to find the correct cell and go into that cell to expand over the text snippet and then be able to find, okay, so it looks like the song was released on October 18th, 2018. So uh, this is what we want to do. So have to utilize both table and text and be able to uh, give uh, the correct answer to some of these complicated questions. And um, I believe that this will require the strengths, right, of both uh, systems. So semantic parsing, relatively more traditional approach, but also robust reading comprehension on text data. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, certainly I think um, there are a lot of uh, this uh, uh, difficult cases uh, that we can imagine, but in reality, uh, I think they're also very practical because those are really, you know, some of the questions that people are curious, um, but uh, when they ask, uh, often uh, they don't get an answer from this 
uh, virtual assistants because uh, the uh, the lack of ability to reason with both uh, text and tables um, at the same time. So uh, to break the boundary, I think we really need a new data set, which is our uh, hybrid QA data set that allows us uh, to jointly reason with table and questions to be able to answer uh, some of the complex uh, queries. For example, in this case, um, you know, uh, will you be able to, for example, understand the relationship, right, between all of these different, um, you know, uh, rows and different cells, what's their relationship, and if we expand, right, on this particular uh, cell, uh, can we extract the useful information, and how does that tie up, right, to individual cells in this table? So we basically provide Wikipedia open domain uh, tables together uh, with their uh, expanded uh, textual descriptions, right, to mechanical turkers. And we ask the mechanical turkers to come up with QA pairs, and they have to utilize both table and text uh, to uh, table and uh, text to answer uh, their own questions. So in this case, uh, once we get this QA pairs, we uh, send it over uh, into some model checker and also human checkers as well to make sure the quality of this uh, QA pairs are good. Uh, if they do require uh, sophisticated listening, uh, they do need, um, you know, um, just not just simple lookup, but actually uh, reasoning with both table and text to come up with the answer. So if uh, that reaches our goal, we'll accept uh, this QA pairs and then add it to the collection of the hybrid QA data set. So we ended up with um, a data set of about 70,000 QA pairs over 13,000 tables. And 57% uh, of the answers are in the passages and 43% are in the tables. So uh, even though we might need to utilize both table and text to answer the question, but again, sometimes the answers are located in the tables and sometimes the answers are located uh, in the passages. Um, and for each table, we can find about, you know, 44 uh, relevant passages. So these are still uh, pretty big tables. Um, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of interesting things that we can do with this data set. So one thing we would be very curious is to taking, uh, is to take a direction starting from these tables. So if we start from these tables, and can we quickly locate, right, which cell may actually contain the relevant information. So one thing we can do is to first link the top K rows uh, according to this query, and then we rank, right, which one is the most likely row uh, that includes the uh, related information. And then in that particular row, okay, and then we can rank individual cells. And once we found the cell, then we go into that document, right, we then, you know, go into that hyperlink and then read that, you know, end um, textual description and the linked passage. So this is basically our approach. Uh, first do uh, row linking and then do ranking. So we find, you know, the, this particular row may contain the answer using the bird ranker. And then finally, uh, the uh, top one cell ranker. And we found out these two documents, right, may be relevant. Um, and in this case, uh, we send these two documents together with this particular cell uh, to this uh, BERT model and ask the BERT model to give us uh, the reading comprehension result and answer uh, user's question. So uh, this is our experimental result for hybrid QA. So we found that with table and only, um, you know, we are only able to get about 8% uh, exact match result. With text only, we're able to get about 20%. With this combined model that does, you know, ranking, filtering, and also linking together with reading comprehension by using both text and table, we're able to get about 44% uh, exact match result. Whereas for human, again, on um, this hybrid QA data set, they can get to about close still, uh, close to 90% uh, exact match result, still very close uh, to the performance of squad. So, uh, how can we actually teach machines to understand both table and text and then to uh, answer some of these complicated questions that require both text and, uh, you know, tables to answer? I think this is uh, still a very challenging thing to, uh, 
uh, to do. So for numerical questions, I think um, it was particularly challenging. And uh, we also see that if there are uh, multiple staffs, um, and you know, in our case, we have four staffs, the reading comprehension uh, components actually has the lowest um, accuracy uh, in this case. But again, I think this is uh, still a relatively challenging data set. And um, not too long ago, actually last year, over the summer, so when Wen Hu was interning at Google AI, uh, they and the, the Google folks, they basically uh, want to build a more generalized version of hybrid QA. Because when we talk about hybrid QA, again, we have this, you know, sort of table in comprehension style of tasks that uh, we are actually providing this table, right? Then you know the answers are coming from this table. Again, this might not be the most realistic assumption. It's just a simplified approach. Uh, so in this case, um, for the OTT QA data set, Google folks actually decontextualize all of the questions we have in the hybrid QA data set, and they recollected all of this open domain QA pairs. So they want to expand this into um, 400,000 of candidate tables. So the first task is actually to retrieve the table, right? Uh, instead of directly um, utilizing a table of inches and then give an answer. So they end up with 400,000 uh, candidates of tables and 5 million candidate passages, right? To find the evidence. And this OTT QA data set is also uh, available and release uh, the data set uh, to the public. So you can um, access this uh, if you are, are interested in this particular data set. Okay, so uh, before I move to the next part, any questions so far? Uh, there's someone who raised their hand. Let's see, oh, uh, uh, Kenji, what is your question? Yeah, um, this is a question for maybe both first and the second part. What do you think about the approach by the GPT-3? They claim to be that uh, more data should be able to answer structured question rather than just lexical. What do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we um, tried GPT-2 on some of our uh, problems and uh, we found that uh, certainly it contains some knowledge, right, uh, in the uh, database. But for GPT-3, um, again, uh, first of all, this is just a commercial uh, API, right? So, um, you know, we've tested briefly, but um, we found that it is still very challenging to use GPT-3 to deal with table data because for the text, well, you can guess um, and you can also try to uh, create some of the future learning examples, but um, I think that's mostly for the generation component. So the third part that I'm going to talk about is more relate to, relating to the GPT-3 uh, because the third part that I'm going to talk about is on generation. So in that case, we did try GPT-2. Um, it, it can give us some relatively reasonable result, but the first two part uh, is mostly relating to uh, extraction, which I believe is not like the uh, strengths of the GPT-3 model, but of course, you know, there's also T5 and they claim, you know, without any uh, retrieval, then you just directly answer questions from T5. There are some, you know, recent interesting papers, but I think still, I wouldn't say that can actually replace and, you know, an I, neural IR DPR type of, you know, open domain question answering system. Thank you. Okay, so that's great. Um, I think I only have 15 minutes left and uh, thank you Kenji for a very nice question. So that's actually, you know, helped me to motivate about the third part, which is relating to, to generation, right? So, and uh, generation I think is also kind of very important part because in addition to understand the structured information, how can you utilize the structured information uh, for uh, reliable generation, right? So I think this is still a challenge because uh, in the past, we've seen that still is uh, difficult to uh, ship, right? The products that utilize the sequence sequence models or the neural generative models because of the hallucination of the facts and also some of the uncertainties. And um, um, in data to text generation, we're going to show you um, how to actually build uh, relatively high quality 
uh, system utilizing some of the existing uh, techniques and also some of the new techniques that we develop in our lab. So uh, that's sort of the goal, but um, there were also some challenges, right, for uh, data to text generation. So data to text generation, for those of you who don't know, it, you can think about it as going from the right-hand side of the Wikipedia info box where you have structured information to the first sentence of your Wikipedia in track in text, right? How can you directly synthesize that structured information into, you know, someone's, you know, biography, right, in their first sentence? So this is data to text generation is very common, commonly used in storytelling, uh, in, you know, advertisement, and in some of these um, applications. So one challenge could be that um, there are some unseen slots, right? Some out of domain uh, headers uh, that make it uh, relatively challenging uh, to generalize into some of the unseen domains. So if you train in particular uh, domain and then you um, test in a different domain, how well can you do, right? So this is, again, I think is a big challenge. So in our case, uh, what we want to do is to build a, a relatively robust solution that uh, unify the graph representation for the underlying knowledge graph, and then utilize the pre-training techniques um, to improve the robustness of the data to text generation system. So we propose a graph encoder uh, to encode the underlying knowledge graph from your input data because it's data to text or input is structured and output is text, right? So we use graph encoder uh, for encoding uh, entities, their relationships and the knowledge subgraph. And then uh, with this sequence decoder, we synthesize and generate a uh, sentence and present it uh, to the user. So we want to present a um, universal approach, right? To do this and generalize this. And uh, that's the graph encoder and decoder. And once we have that, right, so imagine that what if we can actually try to utilize Wikipedia uh, and trying to utilize the uh, hyperlinks, right, in Wikipedia. So for any sentence, right, with multiple entities, if you're able to extract the entity and also understand, you know, which subgraph, right, in Wikidata they belong to, then we have this automated, um, you know, automatically aligned a sentence and a graph pairs, right? For any of the sentences in Wikipedia, then with that aligned graph and text information, you can send to a pre-training model um, to do self-supervised training. And again, um, so I think interesting thing with this approach is that this does not require any human notation as opposed to the classic approach in data to text generation that you often have to get human write some sentences about this particular input, right? About the structured input. But in this case, we're taking a more distantly supervised approach. So for any sentences in Wikipedia, for example, there's an article about Houston Rockets. So we take a sentence describing four of the, you know, three players and, you know, particular title. Uh, then we use these four entities to query the Wikidata. And from the Wikidata, we're able to get a knowledge subgraph connecting all of the entities, right? in uh, Wikidata. So the cool thing with this approach is a distance supervision approach because we don't have to do any annotation, but based on these hyperlinks and the underlying you know, links right, between all these entities and their relationships, we can automatically extract uh, their knowledge subgraph and we can construct right, this alignment between sentences and the knowledge subgraph at almost no cost, right? So we don't have to do any uh, annotation to generate the text from the knowledge graph, but we know that these two uh, sources are aligned um, based on this uh, distance supervision approach. And of course, the reason why I said this data, you know, distance supervision is because sometimes, you know, you can still get relatively noisy result, right? So for example, some of the sentences are not super interesting because they may have very, you know, small overlap between uh, the knowledge graph and also the sentence. So there's not much reasoning that you need to do. For example, the first sentence. Whereas the second sentence, it says, AS Roma is a football club based in Rome, Italy, that you do can utilize uh, some of these um, interesting entities and their relationship to perform the reasoning problem. 
And in this case, we say that this is relatively high quality alignment uh, based on distance supervision. And we also want to make sure that uh, we don't get uh, some of these, uh, you know, just single entity uh, sentences that you can't really make use, right, of the underlying knowledge graph. And you can't really understand, you know, much of this underlying uh, relationship. Um, and towards the end, we build a KG2 text data set that uh, has about 7 million aligned knowledge graph and text pairs. And this includes 1.8 million entities, uh, about, you know, uh, 16 million triples uh, that we can use uh, for this task. And then we went ahead and sent this uh, large scale KG2 text data set for pre training uh, using our graph encoder and also our text decoder uh, in the pre training. And after the pre training, we fine tune this model on all of this existing uh, individual data to text generation problems. And we end up with pretty good results. So, for example, for fully supervised learning settings using, using the Blue 4, uh, that we are able to uh, beat the CFDR result uh, by a very good margin on very uh, on various of different data sets with this KGBT uh, pre training plus uh, text approach. Uh, so, uh, this is a fully supervised learning setting. Uh, I think what's more interesting is in this fusion learning settings that we can just utilize, let's say, for, for example, 0.5% of the web NLG data, uh, but then get really good performance uh, on this data set. And similarly, for E2E NLG, we can use only 0.1% of the training data and get about 70, uh, 40 uh, blue four points with, the, uh, uh, with our approach comparing to uh, some of the GPT-ish models and some of the uh, existing uh, state-of-the-art models uh, for this problem. So the uh, takeaway message for uh, the third part is that I would say that the KGPT model works relatively well uh, for structured data and uh, the way how we align uh, this um, sentence and knowledge graph pairs, I think is a very interesting way to think about self-supervised learning combining with distance supervision. And uh, what we can see in the result is that they significantly improve models generalization on unseen data, and it performed much better uh, than just you know GPT-2, um, and also requires uh, fewer computing resources to do this. So once you have this aligned text and graph data, so to conclude today's presentation, I would say that you know table-based fact-checking is an interesting way uh, to you know to try to understand how we can test the reasoning capability of text and tables. And um, I think there are a lot of interest from the community right now uh, trying to improve the uh, reasoning capability in this mixed uh, setting, in this uh, heterogeneous uh, sources. And the second thing is that um, question answering is more like uh, you know generalization of uh, table-based fact-checking. There's different applications but I think it's going to be super uh, important going to the future because we do need systems uh, that is capable of understanding tables and tags and knowledge graph and images. And um, I think this is uh, going to the, be, be the future for this uh, virtual assistants uh, trying to gather all sources of different information and being able to uh, improve the recall for many of these uh, different questions. And finally, I also show that KGPT approach that uh, significantly improved over the GPT-2 style uh, solution. And by combining distance supervision and self-supervised learning, then we can basically use uh, distance supervision to gather this alignment between structured data and unstructured data, and then apply right, this pre-training approach uh, and fine tune them on downstream applications so it turned out they actually worked relatively well for uh, many of this uh, data to text uh, generation data sets. And with all that, I want to thank you for uh, you know, joining our AI seminar today. Um, I have all of the data sets and uh, code available for all three projects that I talk about today. Uh, I want to thank all of my students and also sponsors and uh, very happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Uh, thank you again. Um, does anyone here have uh, questions? Uh, especially NLP folks who might have a uh, 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 sort of uh, work where, where this might be an inspiration for their work. Um, all right, well, I guess we're, uh, we, we don't, oh, here's, here's a question. A question from uh, Rabiul. Um, uh. Can I ask now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So, uh, this, I guess the second paper maybe. So there was a BART model and trying to just represent the table into BART uh, using natural language. So, do you think that uh, like we need different kind of like uh, model to uh, train this sort of data? I mean, text data, not BART-like architecture. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rab, uh, Rabi. I think that's a definitely a very interesting question because uh, what I observe, you know, the best performance on this table-based uh, fact-checking and table-based QA is that they are uh, essentially uh, utilizing the uh, table-based pre-training, right? And for table-based pre-training, um, I think what Google folks did was they did collect a large number of tables on the internet and then they specifically trained a pre-training model just for tables, right? You can search for tapas. And I think there are a few others um, as well. And once you actually see all this different type of table on the internet, then you sort of have a very good grasp of what, you know, in general tables look like, right? On the internet. So what do the header looks like? You know, what do the cells look like? And what is actually the interaction between rows and cells that's happening? And how does that you know, happen uh, for different domains, for different tasks? Um, I think that background knowledge is kind of as important, right? As the pre-trained models uh, in NLP. And they've actually shown that when you apply this separately pre-trained table models together, right? With BERT for text understanding, that gives you much better results uh, comparing to just use BERT, right? For um, table-based pre-training. So the, I think they were able to get like 70 something. Results are actually quite uh, impressive um, from uh, Thomas Muller and some other folks at the uh, Google Research Zurich. So that's, I think, what uh, people uh, found uh, successful in this context. Yeah, I was, I was guessing something like that. Yeah, that's, and thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Savas? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thank you, William, for your talk. Uh, I just had a question if you would be able to describe how you would be able to generate negative data, um, uh, artificial negative data you could train your model on. Um, because this is something I'm, wor I'm working on and I would like to not, uh, know your opinion. Thanks. Right, yeah, so that's an uh, excellent question, right? Because uh, for this uh, three papers I, I'm actually showing you, uh, uh, today, uh, we actually mostly use the negative example created by human, right? So humans are still pretty good at doing this. And we use the uh, human generated negative examples. Uh, for machine generation, I think there are some challenges uh, because how can you guarantee, right? The negative examples that you generated are really negative examples, right? So uh, I think there were some challenges along that line. Uh, we have a very recent paper uh, by one of our visiting students, and then we are actually taking a more structured approach um, and trying to make sure that uh, the generated examples are negative examples. For example, uh, by doing you know, earlier work uh, with Wenhan's um, iClear 2020 paper in uh, WikiLM, we're actually trying to just you know, generate negative examples by replace the entity with another entity, right? That is uh, with the same type. So entity type based replacement, this is what we tried uh, for this pre-trained encyclopedia paper. So that, rel that works relatively well uh, for us when we were building this large knowledge grounded pre-trained model 
uh, for uh, our iClear paper last year. And uh, the other thing that our visiting student uh, tried is to look at fact checking, right? So for fact checking, how do you come up with the uh, negative uh, example? So uh, we do want to give some constraints. So for example, uh, for, the, uh, for the answers, uh, we can find the uh, answers from another document, right? That is course related and then replace the existing uh, answer from the one from the another document. So we're trying to do something that is relatively more structured replacement rather than just generating negative examples purely from, from scratch. So um, in that case, uh, we're hoping that uh, this kind of replacement operations uh, will lead to a relatively uh, higher quality uh, in, and you know, relatively more reliable uh, negative answers um, in some of our problems. So just to be clear, you take a secondary table uh, and uh, replace, take a sentence that it's true in that table and test it on another table that, ha that is related but uh, cannot answer the, um, the sentence basically. Is that true? Um, no, so uh, I was talking about a slightly different uh, project. So for the, um, the replacement project, we were basically looking at um, you know, fact checking and question answering. So in that case, uh, it's mostly text data, right? So it's not about replacing uh, the, um, the, the different cells from different tables. We haven't tried that, but what we tried was mostly say, let's say, you know, the second one hybrid um, you know, QA that you find this particular uh, passage, right? So from the table, you find a passage and from the passage, you know, uh, there are a whole bunch of noun phrases and some of these noun phrases that we may be able to uh, sample a replacement, right? From another relevant document. For example, uh, there's a different song, uh, there's a different year and different release date then we basically sample a different answer that doesn't really match this string, but uh, still relatively similar. So we replace, right, uh, this particular release date with uh, another song's release date. So in that case, you have a relatively higher quality uh, negative example because we have some constraints on the type, right, in this replacement process. Great, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Junji? Yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, thanks, uh, William, for the talk. Um, I was uh, mostly curious about the uh, KG2 text generation part. So um, my question is that um, there, there are lots of uh, entities, uh, relation or attributes in the Wikidata knowledge base. And how would you select those uh, entity to generate those uh, the rel the relevant entities to generate the correct sentence? And um, because I know that there's some uh, entities that has a bunch of uh, attributes or relations with the other uh, entities, and is is um is not efficient to um combine all this information together to generate the sentence because some of the entity attributes are not relevant at all. So I just want to see, uh, know your thoughts. Right, yeah, thank you, thank you, Jinjie. Uh, so yeah, so I think uh, that was exactly the goal of this um, you know, universal graph representation that we were certainly trying to uh, filter the unrelevant, uh, irrelevant information and being able to preserve some of the key information in this uh, graph representation, right? Because I think when we are extracting the, uh, the subgraph, we also have some rules, for example, like, you know, how large you want, you know, this particular subgraph to be, right? Do you want to capture, let's say all of the outlinks for the subgraph? I would say for our case, it wasn't that bad because for, so we start from a sentence, right? We found Wikipedia sentence, uh, normally, I would say there are a couple of entities and there are some relationship, but um, unless this is like a super node, right? So let's say Lady Gaga and a whole bunch of other, you know, really big celebrities, then uh, in that case, you will have some really big super node. Then in this case, you have to do some filtering, right? To be able to, uh, to say, you know, what part of the subgraph that you are uh, trying to 
uh, leverage in this case. But I would say for most cases, um, because Wikipedia is still having this long tail distribution, um, mm -hmm. those are fine. So we don't get like always this, you know, multiple uh, super nodes in one sentence. Uh, at most one, but I would say they also follow the ZFN distribution. So if that's the case, there were some filtering step in creating uh, this graph representation, but uh, the hope was also that the graph representation was able to learn uh, what are the key information, right? That is aligned to this input sentence. So because once we do this distance supervision alignment, you have the sentence, you have the graph, and gradually your system can actually learn for this particular sentence, right? What are the key parts of the graph that your system want to encode, you want to put weights on. So that itself is also uh, another uh, filtering and the con uh, condense, uh, condensing process. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and especially selecting those uh, entity or attributes. Uh, <clears throat> my my follow-up question is related to the uh, evaluation. Like, when we generate a bunch of tags, uh, usually we use a blue score or the other matrix to evaluate those ones. But for KG to text generation, um, I think that uh, probably we need a more sophisticated uh, matrix to evaluate whether the uh, model really relies on these uh, entities to generate the text. Or, and what's your thoughts? Yeah. So. I think uh, natural language evaluation is uh, definitely, uh, you know, important topic. So I haven't got much time to talk about natural language generation and their evaluation. There has been a lot of debates, um, I think, uh, on what would be a good metric, right? So blue, um, I think certainly works for machine translation, but there are a lot of um, discussions about the issues for blue on other generation problems, for example, longer text or dialogue, right? In data to text generation, we mostly found that it aligns relatively well with uh, human judgment. But there are, of course, many different things it does not capture. For example, you know, hallucination of particular, you know, objects, right? So if you actually replace an object with a different object, uh, then you may still see relatively high blue score. So uh, there was some work on looking at uh, you know, object hallucination uh, in uh, vision language uh, problems. So go, how do you do captioning? But uh, there are also people proposing these cheer scores uh, to look at, um, you know, uh, whether you have, you know, a lot of hallucination of the entities. Um, so they do entity level evaluation. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, this is still, I think, a relatively uh, challenging problem. There were, you know, also birth scores, as you know, looking at the semantic level overlap. Uh, but uh, again, I think uh, there are a lot of different subtleties, right? When we talk about the factual accu accuracy, right? Uh, the factual accuracy is uh, somehow relatively, still relatively difficult to evaluate by just staring at the uh, blue scores. Yes, um, I agree. This is um, still an open question. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions? Uh, all right. Uh, in that case, I want to thank you again, William, for this excellent talk. Um, uh, it was it was absolutely great to hear. Uh, and uh, with that, I think uh, Amy, you can stop the recording and. Uh,